from the studios of Staten Island Community Television, you're watching In the Bleachers, the TV show for the world's most passionate sports fans. Hello everyone, I'm Jamie Hickson. Usually you see me here talking on the phone to my friend Hector Boza. Hector has the night off so he can recuperate, but we have the probably next great thing. My longtime friend, T-Dog Tomasio, a four-time Interborough Wrestling Association world champion. And also a guy who has long made his mark in the independent circuit, specifically here on Staten Island. He was kind enough to make, an, make his way over here and talk about his life and career. It's great to see you again. It's great to see you, too. It's good to be back. I haven't been around here in a while. So how does the studio look to you? Like I said, different. It's yeah. brighter, cleaner. In fact, I noticed they took out the window over there and put a mirror. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it only seems like it. That's how clean the, the window looks right now. You mean they finally got a confident cleaning crew in here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gee, what a shock. <laughs> Oh, well, that was nice of them. Yeah. Last time I saw these windows, you could actually write your name in them. Mm -hmm. You want to talk covered with dust? I mean, really. Oh, well. You could probably do some graffiti on that. That's uh, how bad they were here. Well, I think I saw a little bit of that at one point in time or another. Mm -hmm. I remember the time my former co-host on my show, uh, Dream Warrior, tagged a little graffiti on yeah. Kenny Graham's car. Wow. <laughs> Rebel. Nah, whatever gave you that idea. <laughs> Just because he got my ex-wife's car in the, in the process. Actually, he was aiming for my ex-wife's car. I see. How is the Dream Warrior, anyway? Well, last I heard from him, he's still sending oddball pictures and stuff over Facebook. He's still racing and dr working his uh, sanitation job. I don't talk to him that much because there's really not a lot to talk about since I'm retired. He seems to be semi-retired. Mm -hmm. But he's still bike racing, you know, the motocross stuff. Mm -hmm. And he's good. And he's still working in the private sanitation. That's good. As far as I know, I don't know. You know, I remember the good old days when we had multiple wrestling shows over here. There was your show. There then was there the ones that stunk. Yeah. <laughs> Although um, Ringside Highlights was pretty decent back in the day. Oh, yeah, that was a very good show. But that's because Eddie Gunn's being the great producer that he is, mm -hmm. knew what the fans liked. Yeah. And he knew how to entertain people. Mm -hmm. His then wife, Ro Rumble Rose, they were a great team. Yeah. And, you know, since he since he is long retired from that, uh, at least in New York, mm -hmm. I wonder what he's doing. He's living in West Virginia. He's got himself a new girlfriend. Yeah. And... He seems to be enjoying life, which is nice. So far, so good for him. Uh, yes. Let's hope um, if he gets married again, it lasts eternally. Yeah, no, this, maybe this I shouldn't say that. I don't think she would deserve to be stuck with him for eternity. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie's a good guy, though. Just kidding, folks. I happen to like Eddie a whole lot. He's a great friend. Mm -hmm. I also like busting his chops, especially when yeah. he doesn't know what I'm talking about. But mentioning his show, and we'd be remiss if we did not mention your show that you did for quite a long time, which is Beyond the Squared Circle. From 2004 to 2016. Twelve good years that you had here. Mm -hmm. And we had so many characters make their way through the show. Yeah. And the guests that you had were really, really top-notch. Well, some of them were. We had, I had found some really interesting independent wrestlers from all over the area. Mm -hmm. I got some from Gino Caruso, got some from Johnny Rods, you know, picked up some of the local talent, which I don't even hear from anymore, but, you know. Yeah. You know, most, since, since I'm not really as affiliated with the business anymore since my retirement, yeah, I don't really pay close attention to what's going on anymore. Yeah. You know, I am thinking about bringing back another uh, talk show. Really? Another wrestling show. I'm just not sure what kind of show I'd want it to be. And it would be a di under a different title, right? Pretty much, because Beyond the Squared Circle basically meant 
going beyond what the wrestlers do in the ring. Yeah, this is I, true. I, I was thinking more of something on the order of the wrestling connection. Mm -hmm. You know, but I have to find a, another name for it because uh, David Cohen's owned that show for years. Yeah, this is another true. Another good guy I heard from. Yeah. David's a great guy. David Cohen, oh, yes. I keep in, in contact with him from time to time. As a matter of fact, uh, he was kind enough to invite my fiance and I for dinner one time. And it was really, really cool speaking with him, not just about the, the wrestling biz, but also about his forays as a teacher. Oh, he's a teacher now? Yeah. I was teaching aware in the New York that. City public school system. That's pretty cool. Mm hmm. That's something he never mentioned to me at all. Yeah. I talk to him every once in a while. Mm hmm. Uh. Well, as it is with every independent wrestler who's trying to br break into the big time, they need to find some kind of income in order to support themselves. Oh, yeah. Well, I was doing that as a security officer for a number of years. Mm hmm. And we all know how all that worked. Yeah. I mean, I used to work in uh, the area known as Park Hill on, right here on Staten Island. I'm curious, though. Does one moment from Beyond the Squared Circle stand out from everything else that you've done? Well, I have to think about that. But one of the things that it will always stand out was when we were trying to set up a show at New Utrecht High School in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. The main event was supposed to be Mad Dog Joe Stone from Greenpoint against Staten Island's wrestling icon, Magic. Yes, sir. And midway through the second segment of the show, Magic is sitting here talking about what he's going to do to Mad Dog, the way, the way Mad Dog was in the first part of the show. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're banding it back and forth because the X-Clan was here. Uh, I remember the X-Clan. Those guys were all nuts. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the things I like about them. I like crazy people. Mm -hmm. Thing was, halfway through the show, out of the blue, Mad Dog jumped on on magic. Wow. And then a Pier 6 brawl going in here. Oh, that's crazy. Oh, yeah. Look around, folks. Look how small this studio is. <laughs> and we actually put a small Pier 6 brawl in here. Yeah. Oh, yes. Also, there's a lot more stuff over on the, on the corner here. It's not there anymore. What happened to all that crap? You know, the one guy that I remember from the X-Clan who was always really, really kind to me was Sean Black. Oh, yeah. Well, Sean Black, well, I thought was a very nice guy. Mm -hmm. You know, he lived his character the way he was supposed to. But away from that, he was a very kind, accommodating person. You know, someone you could talk to like an everyday man. You know, a lot like some guys that get out, they finish their uh, business in the ring or whatever. And all of a sudden, as they go getting ready to leave, they don't want to greet their fans. They want to be very standoffish. Mm -hmm. Sean's not like that. Yeah. That's one of the things that impressed me about him and the X-Clan, because the X-Clan is pretty much the same way. Mm -hmm. But then I've also had guys like Danger on the show. Mm -hmm. A man who's a decent wrestler, has no idea how to run a promotion, but, you know, he's a decent wrestler. I've, I've seen him in action a few times. I actually saw him in a match against Mad Dog at the Goldie Maple Academy in Queens. Mm-hmm. He pretty much got his head handed to him. Yeah. He ended up winning the match because he he uh, somehow he managed to bash Mad Dog over the head with some type of um, wooden object or something like that. And this is all over an argument that happened earlier in the day while, while they were prepping for the show. Mm -hmm. You know, Danger kept coming down on me about how I have no business being in the wrestling business. And Joe took it, as a, took it offensively because me and Joe have been friends for many years. And, you know, it was a simple case of Joe wanted to rip him a new tush, you know? Yeah. But fortunately, things didn't elevate too far beyond that. The match went over pretty well. Mm -hmm. And I was actually surprised that Mad Dog put Danger over. But, you know. That's an interesting concept that I've always been very, very curious about. And that's the fact of one wrestler putting someone over. When do you know is the right time? When is the right time that you know that you can put an opponent over? 
Well, it depends on the course of the match. For example, um, my first match against Coco Power, I knew when to put him over because he was getting winded. You know, I kept bouncing him out of the turn, off the turnbuckles and off some of the ropes. Got him with a couple of nice high drop kicks, mm -hmm. and you know, a couple of good shots here and there. And uh, it got to a point where he was unable to take it. He was breathing like a blast furnace. Mm -hmm. So I'm going, I'm going, going to make a pin attempt. And I saw how he, how he was looking and how he was breathing. So I just made the pin right there. That's how I won this belt for the second time. All right. So, you know, uh, sometimes you can tell if your opponent is getting blown up, meaning basically he's running out of steam, he can't breathe very well you mm -hmm. know, because of the heat or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, either to put him over or go over, go over on him, you know. In the case of my 1999 retirement match at Mad Dog's Block Party, I was expecting something where I was going to have to put, um, it was me versus Foo Foo the Butcher. I was expecting something midway through the match where I'd have to put, he'd have to put me over, you know, and because uh, it was very hot. It was 85 degrees, and I'm wearing one of these things. Oh, wow. And I was outside in the bright sun. Mm. Uh, you know, it's like, um, it would have gone over with the right pinning combination if I had caught his actions because uh, he got thrown out of the ring mm -hmm. or he slid out of the ring, came around the side, came back into the ring, hit me with a low blow cheap shot. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I, I go down. He starts attacking me. Then these three other jabronis from Jersey All Pro come out and attack me as well. Uh-oh. Yeah, and then Jay Lover joined them. Mm-hmm. So I'm getting a massive beatdown, and Mad Dog and Bulldozer are there to clear the ring. Mm -hmm. They put these guys over their knees, you know, a couple of backbreakers, yeah. a couple of power slams, mm -hmm. choke slams, and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And then, the ma well, technically the match ended by disqualification, considering the outside interference. Then, as the referee is handing me the world title, Jay Lover comes in from behind, and offers me a chair mm -hmm. off the back of my skull. Nice guy. <laughs> then he tries to help me up. He grabs my mask, pulls me straight up, and hits me in the face with the chair. On the subject of that, did you ever suffer any concussions from chair shots to the head? Actually, no, because I've, I've only taken really that one. I mean, Mad Dog did a goof chair shot once. Mm hmm and he, he was using, you know, those, uh, those chairs they're using in kindergarten classes? You know, it's a plastic seat in the metal frame? Yep. He was using one of those. He barely tapped me with it, though, and I didn't realize what he wanted to do. I see. So, you know, Jerry or Jay Lover could have given me a concussion, but fortunately the mask was padded enough where he, it only gave me a bad headache for a couple of days. Interesting. And, you know, that's when I retired the first time. Okay. You would think I would have had enough sense to stay retired, but... You know, you're not the only one who's considered a comeback multiple times. And it's not just in the wrestling industry either. So many, not just athletes, but... Entertainers and such. Other entertainers have yeah. always thought to themselves that they could probably give it that one last shot. Sometimes it worked out, sometimes it didn't. More often than not, though, it didn't. I mean, I've seen some singers come back, and I'm asking, why? <laughs> I've seen yeah. some wrestlers come back, and I look at them, you're kidding, right? I mean, who in his right mind is going to make multiple comebacks, especially in the wrestling industry where you're putting your body on the line all the time? I can tell you one such guy, Terry Funk. Terry Funk doesn't even understand the word retirement. Nope. It's amazing, too. He's got to be in at least his late 70s now, isn't he? Uh, well, when did he win the ECW title the first time? Do you remember? I think it was 1994, 1995, maybe. Okay, he was 50. He was 54 years old then, I think. Hmm. So he's got to be in his late 60s now. Yeah. 
Oh, look at his brother Dory. We're talking to the man who farts dust. <laughs> I mean, he used to wrestle with Abraham Lincoln. Well, let, let me tell you, they may be old, but man, they had outstanding careers. Oh, yeah. They're, they're the old school wrestlers. Mm -hmm. That's why their careers are much better than what you see today. They really put their all into it. If they got hurt, they kept going. Today, you see a wrestler get hurt, he's out for six months. Yeah. As a matter of fact, just recently, I saw Terry Funk in a match against Harley Race for the NWA title. It, this, this was taking place in Houston, and I think it was 1979 that the match took place. Okay, that would be during Race's, uh, I think, second reign as champion. Mm-hmm. They had probably one of the best matches against each other that I've ever seen two wrestlers have. And they were bloodied like it was no tomorrow. I know how that is, especially with those two. I mean, Terry Funk has always been a bleeder. Mm-hmm. Two out of three falls match. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was really crazy. I mean... Yeah, but look at it this way. We're wrestling fans, or I was, but you're a wrestling fan. You love crazy. Yeah, we love crazy, but more importantly, we love seeing two wrestlers tell a story. It's not just about um, blow by blow or anything. There has to be great chemistry between the two True. And competitors been great in order mm -hmm. with Harley Race yeah. and Terry Funk mm -hmm. and Dory Funk Jr. Mm -hmm. There was a, back in those days. There was always great chemistry. You didn't see two guys put in the ring who didn't belong against each other. Nowadays, you see that all the time. And mm -hmm. you're like, you're serious, right? Yeah, all right. You put The Miz in with somebody like, uh, I don't know, Axel, uh, Curtis Axel? Yeah. Axel is a good wrestler. They mm -hmm. won't give him a chance to show off. You know who his father was? I'm not really sure. Who was it? Mr. Perfect. Kurt Hennig? Mm -hmm. His really? grandfather was Larry Hennig. Oh, Larry the Axe Hennig, I remember very well. And Kurt, I remember from his AWA days. Mm -hmm. And he was an outstanding performer. Yep. And from what I've heard of uh, Curtis Axel and what I've seen, he does have the talent. They just won't let him use it. He's one of the few people who proves the talent is hereditary. I mean... Look at Ric Flair and Charlotte Flair. Charlotte can wrestle, though. Mm -hmm. Look at Ric Flair and David. David couldn't wrestle his way out of a paper bag with a machine gun. Yeah. Not everyone is cut out for the business, mm -hmm. though. And, you know, you see the few who are, and they stick with it, sometimes for longer than they should. I mean, Abdul Little Butcher stuck with it until his early 70s. Mm-hmm. The man's got to be close to 80 years old now. Yeah. I think he is 80, 80 years mm -hmm. old by now. And you mentioned Harley Race before. Yeah. One thing they should we should have thought to do for this show, we should have put a memorial notice up at the end of the show for yeah. him. Yeah. Because he just passed away, what, a couple of weeks ago? Mm-hmm. It was tr tragic. I was never a big Race fan. Yeah. But I did admire his talent. Mm-hmm. He knew what he was doing in that ring. And let me tell you, at a time when... Wrestlers didn't really do that much shooting as we know it as today. Harley Race was a hell of a talker. Oh, yeah, that's true. Wait a minute, by shoot, you're talking about as far as interviews or mm -hmm. in the ring? Mm hmm Well, when Harley Race was giving you those promos, they weren't scripted by the front office. He made those up by himself. Most of the wrestlers outside of WWE did that. Vince has to control everything that goes on with WWE, and that sometimes includes the promo. Yeah. That's why sometimes you listen to a promo and you're thinking to yourself, why is this guy talking? Yeah. Do you really want to hear him? You like him as a wrestler. You like, the, you like what he can do in the ring. Mm-hmm. Listening to him on the mic is like listening to um, his fingernails going down a chalkboard. <laughs> or you get a couple of incidents where you get guys like the Ultimate Warrior. You listen to one of his promos and you come away thinking to yourself, what the hell did he just say? <laughs> I 
I did that many times, and I'm a big warrior fan. Don't don't kid yourself though. He was pretty charismatic. I mean, oh yeah. He usually talked about going back to parts unknown, but Which he is, actually made the people believe it. Oh yeah. Well, parts of unknown I hear is like two miles outside of Denmark. <laughs> I like, can probably believe that. Hell, I used to be from parts unknown. <laughs> but it's interesting, though. Well, I changed, you, I changed my address because I kept forgetting how to get home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's interesting. You mentioned before that uh, you're not a wrestling fan anymore. What's also uh, pretty fascinating is since you've been in the business for a long time, you don't watch wrestling on TV as much anymore. No. Why? Because the only thing I'm able to really catch is Monday Night Raw and uh, Tuesday Night Smackdown Live. Mm -hmm. And they're just giving you the same crap over again. You know, they're recycling old gimmicks and hoping they'll work again. And I'm looking at it like, what for? You guys can't come up with something original? Like that Team Challenge series they did a couple months ago. Yeah. Look like a very cheap ripoff of the ch- team challenge series done in the AWA just before yeah. they folded. Mm-hmm. And you realize that team challenge is what helped fold the AWA. It was so bad. Yeah. And you know, they keep having a lot of the wrestlers do the same gimmicks. For example, Elias. You know, walk with Elias. Uh, that, what is he doing? Some of that stuff is pretty funny, though, because yeah. he's doing great with the fans. Yeah, but the thing is, he's the honky tonk, honky tonk man played sideways. <laughs> he's not quite as dumb a character as the honky tonk man was. Mm-hmm. But he's getting over because the fans like the way he works. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know about his in ring action. I've seen very little of him. But I wasn't not impressed with him as a wrestler, though. As a talker, he he's done very well. But as a wrestler, oh yeah. He's, I've heard a lot of his promos. He's a great talker. Mm-hmm. That's like, you want to talk great talkers, you got to think about the great ones like uh, Hulk Hogan, yeah. Macho Man Randy Savage, Classic. Bret Hart. You mm-hmm. know. Nowadays, you get some of these guys going out there, promos, and you're trying to figure out, why are they talking about something that has nothing to do with the feud they're involved in or something like that? Because I've seen that happen. Yeah. Probably one thing... Or one sequence that I saw that had a lot to do with more of the backstage politics that are going on and less to do with what's going on with his storyline. Backstage poli- politics in WWE? Mm-hmm. It's unheard of. Yep. <laughs> if, you, if you believe that, I've got the yeah. bridge in Brooklyn you might want to buy. The, cl- the classic promo that was done... Uh, on the ramp by CM Punk. Which one? He did a few of them. The last one that he did just before he left. One of the ones where they cut, kept cutting his microphone off. Mm-hmm. Hmm. He was speaking the truth. That's why they kept cutting off the microphone. Mm-hmm. And I remember back in the days when Vince always wanted to keep the inner secrets of wrestling kayfabe. Yeah. You remember Dr. D. David Schultz? Oh, yes. When he basically slapped the hell out of John Stossel for asking if wrestling was fake? Yep. Now Vince goes out of his way to let you know it's fake. Mm Mm-hmm. And he'd already taken over the WWF two years prior to that. Yeah. But that was in 84. Yeah, that was in 84. He took over the WWF in 82. Mm Mm-hmm. He was trying to keep it so the fans thought it was real. Yeah. And then Schultz claimed that McMahon told him, if Stossel asks any questions like that, hit him and show him how real it is. Vince says no. Really? For some reason, I'm more inclined to believe Stossel, uh, Schultz because he got blacklisted from the business after that. Mm-hmm. You know, for it's, telling it the way it was. Yeah. It's a real shame, too, because Dr. D was a really, really tough wrestler. He was oh, the yeah. kind of guy who could probably, if you put him in there against... Uh, a grizzly bear, Dr. D would probably win. It's possible. Look at it this way. He's the kind of wrestler you would put in there with guys like, um, what the hell is that guy's name? Gr- grizzly something. 
uh, Jake Roberts, the father. Oh, Grizzly Smith? Yeah. Yeah. He'd probably, even if he didn't win, he'd give him a good fight. Wow. He's the kind of guy you could put in there with Dick the Bulldog Brower. Mm hmm. And he'd give a good fight. Mm -hmm. He may even win. Yeah. You know, you could put him in there with almost anybody who's really a legitimate tough guy. You know, I, rem I remember the little. Uh shoot that he did in which he invited the cameras into his house to have dinner with his wife and kids. We saw a side of him that I thought, boy. David if, Schultz? Yep. If this is the kind of guy he is at home, then no wonder he's a real jabroni in the, in the ring because he was just nasty. He was so rude to his wife. And uh -huh. rude to his kids. Oh, I, I never even heard about that one. It, it's a really, really famous shoot that he did. It, and it was on Superstars of Wrestling over 35 years ago. You have to watch it. Check it out on YouTube. Uh-huh. Well, wait a minute. If it, was on, if it was shown on Superstars, that means it wasn't a, uh, a shoot. You Very could. likely it was set up. You think so? It's possible. Hmm. Because from what I've heard of guys like that, away from the, the gimmick, they're pretty cool people. Greg Valentine, for example, was always said to be a nasty individual in the ring. You've always seen the way he was really uh, sometimes too tough on his opponent. Greg the Hammer Valentine? Mm -hmm. Probably because uh, that was him when he was uh, stoned or plastered. From what I understand, Greg Valentine has got a big-time substance abuse problem. Well, I don't know about that myself, but what I had heard, because a couple of fans had told me they got the chance to meet Valentine outside of the arena, mm -hmm. you know, especially like at Madison Square Garden, mm -hmm. and they said what a nice guy he was. He offered to pose for pictures, give autographs, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of, that's the thing that's funny, a lot of heels will do that where a lot of faces won't. Yeah. As a I matter mean, of fact, uh, one of my bosses told me that when he was a police officer and he was doing... Um, security at the garden for matches a lot of the heels would invite him into the locker room to pop a cold one not a surprise at all you won't get very many faces they'll do that mm -hmm. it's like look at Brutus beefcake sometimes he plays a real sleazeball character on air mm -hmm. in life he can be a real sleazeball character too yeah Sometime we got to get together. You remember that uh, that super sign we went to? Yeah. Do you still have the disc? I think I do. Yeah. If you don't, let me know. I have the copy you gave me. Okay. And we can we, we could run that. Yeah, that'd be really cool. Actually, if we had thought about it for today, we could have done that. Oh, that would have been awesome. Oh yeah. Well, keep in mind if you want to do the show like this again sometime. Yeah. Or if you want to do it on a, a regularly scheduled night. Mm-hmm. Then we'll do it because you know I interviewed. Beefcake, Jimmy Snooker. Mm -hmm. Great guy, Jimmy Snooker. Yeah. He was cool. Yeah, he was really cool. It's, it's tragic. He passed away suffering from dementia. Yeah. You know. And, and this was also when um, they brought back that old case of uh, his side chick being murdered. Yeah. Well you, know, well, you know, the thing is, that wasn't a side chick. That was supposedly a girlfriend. He mm -hmm. wasn't married at the, t at the time. From what I understand, he was married. Well, not that I know of, because I remember seeing a picture of him with a wife. Isn't the wife he was with when we met him. Mm -hmm. But they couldn't prove that when it happened. Yeah. Where are they going to find proof 30-odd years later? Yeah. I know. She, they, they contacted him with an Ouija board, and they, he, she told him, yes, he did kill me. Wow. Tell me, just tell when me you think you that. No, nah, judge. <laughs> nah. With Ouija boards, you never really know anything. Well, that's true, considering it's basically a fraud. But you know, that's the thing. They thought they came up with new evidence. Mm -hmm. Notice it didn't go anywhere. Yeah. And what are you going to do? Put a seventy-five year, seventy-four year old Alzheimer's patient in jail? What kind of an idiot would do that? The kind that wants to look for some kind of justice and to cover their tracks. Well, aside from the fact that if this woman wasn't Snooker's girlfriend, she was probably a prostitute. There's always that possibility, too. 
at this day and age, nothing surprises me anymore. I know what you mean. I've lived long enough to pretty much have the same outlook. Mm -hmm. You know, we've uh, gone through half an hour, and not once have we talked about uh, your time in the business. Well, we talked a little bit about it, but most of the stuff we can talk about is stuff we have talked about a few times. Mm -hmm. My infamous match against your former co-host, uh, Hector Plaza. Oh, Plaza. brother, spare me. <laughs> what no. a train wreck that was. Yeah, but you got to give him credit. He brought the IBWA world title a lot of heat. He certainly did. Hell, he even got Eddie Guns to get into training to go after this world title. It wasn't mm -hmm. this belt at the time, but, you know. See that? Oh, see that? Isn't that a cute belt? Yep, one I, of the best like to championship belts that anyone could ever wear. At least in my opinion. I know, because I've worn it four times. Mm-hmm. And my saying, I, I ripped off a little bit of Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan. My favorite, my favorite saying is, to be the man, you got to beat the man. Yep, and it's and, no more true than in the squared circle. And also my old Hulk Hogan routine. Yes, sir. Flexing them muscles. <laughs> I, I think I told you this story, too. My first time in the arena of Puerto Rico was a championship match for the IBWA world title. And um, basically, I was going in there blind. Mm -hmm. I'm wrestling a guy that I used to work with, and nobody bothered to tell me he was the, the local hero. He was the hometown hero. Yeah. So I'm working him over in an attempt to reclaim this title. And for some reason, I'm being booed out of the building. Yeah. I mean, they hated me. Mm-hmm. Then that's when I found out why. You know, after the match was over, they handed me the belt. I'm doing the old posing routine. Some guy in the arena yells out, look at that. He thinks he's Hulk Hogan. So I stood there and went. <laughs> Just to annoy him. Oh, boy. And boy, was that fun. Mainly because they couldn't do anything to me because of the fact of the mask. I go down to the locker room. Mm -hmm. I change, put my mask in my duffel bag. And what happened to that mask guy? Where is he? I want to get him, you know. <laughs> Can't do anything about it. And yep. believe me, that annoyed the hell out of them. And you got out of there pretty much uh, unscathed, right? Mm-hmm. It's a good thing that you did because... There were times when other wrestlers did not have it so lucky after matches. Oh, well, that's true. Look at Freddie Blassie. He's been, he'd been stabbed, shot, had acid thrown at him. Mm-hmm. Bret but, Hart actually had a, a fan chase after him with a box cutter after a match once. I remember hearing about that, too. Yeah. That's pretty bad. But, you but, know, the one thing that I think of when I think of wrestling in Puerto Rico is the night that Bruiser Brody wound up being stabbed to death yeah. by one of the invaders. Yep, and he was acquitted. They, couldn't, they didn't have enough proof. I'm like, yeah, okay. I don't know it's, how they couldn't get enough proof. I mean, there was a bloody murder weapon. Yeah, and it had his fingerprints on it. The one thing that would have convicted this guy was Tony Atlas's testimony. Yeah. Tony Atlas is a coward. He refused to testify on Brody's behalf. I have no idea why. He was afraid he'd end up the same way. Ridiculous. The man commits a cold-blooded murder. You're supposed to be a good friend of the man who was murdered, and you don't want to see him get justice? I mean, that's really horrid. Not cool. Not at all. I mean, uh, you're supposed to stick up for your brothers that way. Mm -hmm. And you know how it is in the wrestling business, it's like a fraternity. Yep. So Apparently I, what led to this thing was money. Mm-hmm. Uh, from what I remember reading, I think it was Invader 1 owed money to Bruiser Brody. And he, want, he, he told him to come into the shower, I'll pay him. I'll pay you. He paid him all right. He stabbed him in the stomach. Wasn't that a, a bit of a warning sign? It should have been. Telling someone to go into the shower just so you can get a paycheck? It could have been, yeah. It should have been for Brody, considering the type of man he was. You know, from he what was, I understand, he was a, a really honest guy. 
Yeah. More than just a wrestler. He was also a big time booker. Yeah, from what I heard too, he's a very good family man too. Yeah. So, you know, it's like you would have thought with his experience as a wrestler, he would know not to trust somebody who says something like that. Mm-hmm. But still, like you said, like I said, what well, well, why was Atlas afraid to testify? All he had to do was point the finger and uh, the invader would have gone to prison for life. Yeah. Because that was premeditated. Mm -hmm. But then again, that's also Puerto Rico. Sometimes they have little, uh, what would you call it, sort of like... Loopholes? Yeah, or scandals that prevent somebody from going where they belong. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was very scandalous when you think about it. Yeah. You know, because you know how big a fan base... Bruiser Brody had oh, yes. in places like Puerto Rico, Mexico, Japan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to be suddenly taken that way at such a young age, so because he wasn't that old, it's like, that's really horrible. Early 40s, he passed away. Actually, I think he was 37 or 38 when he, you know, something like that, yeah. Yeah. Late 30s, early 40s. Mm -hmm. But it's still, you know, it's a horrible thing. Yeah. That's like, uh, I wonder what kind of a family Adrian Adonis had outside of the build in the business. It's a good question. You know, considering he was married, I know that, mm -hmm. but I don't know if he had any kids. That was a tragic accident where he died. Yeah. You know, they wanted to spare a deer's life. They should have taken a chance with damaging the van. Then Adonis and the other guy who, who was killed in that accident might still be alive. Yeah. You know, um, if you want to go back to my career, though, we was, let's see, what else What else could I tell you? That you, have, you we have? How'd you first get started? Backyard situation, you know. I've been a wrestling fan since I was, like, uh, f 14, 15. I'm 59 now, so that'll tell you something. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to be able to wrestle where I wasn't going to get hurt and we could have some fun with it. So I opened up... Uh, a backyard promotion um, when I was living in Port Richmond. Mm -hmm. And I've, well, I've been working in, in different situ situations, backyard stuff, since 1983. Or 80, no, 81, actually. Doing a lot of different backyard areas, different one or two matches here and there. And then after Roman Alexis defeated me for the gold... We ran a few shows where I was living. Mm -hmm. Then he gave up the title because he said there wasn't enough competition. Says him, but you know. Uh, he vacated the title. For two years, the title was inactive. But then we worked it out where Coco Power won the IBWA world title mm -hmm. from Roman Alexis. If Roman Alexis heard about this, he'd pitch a bitch real bad. But uh, so what it is is Coco Paro goes into the arena of Puerto Rico as the world champion. Me coming in behind him as the challenger. So that's my first foray actually into the ring. And that worked out pretty well because that match went over beautifully. Good. You know, the second match, however, he was in a bad mood about something. I ended up with a broken toe. A sprained neck that he almost broke. You know, he hit a suplex and he did it wrong. Mm -hmm. Didn't bother to tell me he was going to do it. You know. So I was off for six months while the injuries healed. And then I just kept on going. Have, had a couple of matches against my former tag team partner, Spike Stevens. He won the world title for me. And then a month later, we ended up in a tag team match against Warzone and the Predator. Two very large black individuals. Mm -hmm. Somebody in the locker room called Warzone a porch monkey. This man was six foot five, weighed 500 pounds. You don't say that to a man that big. He spent that whole match trying to kill both of us. Oh, boy. You know, Spike took a, a power bomb from the Predator. Predator did it wrong, dropped him on his shoulder, and dislocated it. Oh. So he tagged me in. 
I drop kicked the predator the man stood there and looked at me I'm like okay I'm laying on the mat looking at him like why didn't he move oh boy <laughs> so the match keeps going you know he Rich gets back in uh, Spike gets back in after pushing his shoulder back into place he stays there for a couple of minutes he tags me back in at the same time war pe- um, predator tagged in Warzone. I hit Warzone with a flying cross body block. He stood there in the middle of the ring, caught me like this in full flight, turned it into a fall away slam. Oh, wow. Yeah. I hit the mat, he hit me, Mullings hit the ceiling. <laughs> I'm like, okay, what the hell am I doing here? Boy. I mean, I've just realized suicide is not painless. You know. So, I was out for a few months with that injury because I practically coughed up both lungs. Oh, wow. You know. So I worked a couple of events for the World Wrestling Union. You remember my buddy Wild thing, right? Yes, I do. When, it came, when he came to the WWU, he ended up getting the veteran status. I was, uh, I was the one deserving of because I'd been there longer. They basically put him up on a pedestal right away. Kind of annoyed me, but I'm not going to uh, really get super angry about it. He's just like, I didn't like it. But, you know, he did a lot of good matches with them. I did a couple of good matches with him. Then I started doing a lot of officiating, you know, st- uh, a lot of stuff like special gift ref- referee stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, keeping, trying to keep order. One time I'm working a show with this kid, Johnny Blaze, against uh, a guy called The Convict. Mm-hmm. The Convict is beating the hell out of this kid. So I'm trying to back him off. He grabs me, goes for uh, a running power slam. I told him, don't even do it, because if you do, this match is over. He did it anyway. He didn't believe me. He hits the, the power slam. The other, Johnny Blaze is over in the other corner, or Johnny Blade was over in the other corner. Mm-hmm. He was sagging in the corner, holding on to his midsection, because, you know, Conrad really beat the hell out of him. Mm-hmm. I crawled away from where the convict was uh, squatting. I raised Johnny's hand in victory. Laying hands on the referees, disqualified. Wow. He he uh, dealt with it, <laughs> you know. But I I had done that. Uh, I think I told you about the 1999 block party. Yes. I refereed a match between homicide. And Monster Mac against the Commando and the Zombie. And I told Homicide before the match started, you touch the referee once, this match is over. So they spent the whole match trying to beat the the tar out of the Commando. You know, they, uh, they were under the impression Commando was responsible for what happened to Mike Stone. Mike Stone died about a little less than a year earlier. And this is like a first memorial show to Mike's memory. So they were trying to destroy the commando because he they felt Mike at one time Mike had a drug problem. He cleaned himself up, and they thought commando pulled him right back in. Mm. I spoke to Mad Dog about it because he's Mike's brother, and he, Mike uh, Joe said no. What happened was he had asthma too, as well as um, other assorted breathing problems. He was playing manhunt with his friends. He couldn't breathe, so he sat down. He's rocking along. He's rocking back and forth on the sidewalk. And he walked f- too far back, and he slammed his head into the into the pavement. Oh! And he died of a cerebral hemorrhage about half hour, forty five minutes later. Wow! It was too bad too, because he was a good kid, great wrestler, injury prone, but a great wrestler. You know, then the match I had, it was me and El Savahi Jr. against Warzone and Warpath. This is two years after I promised myself never to get in the ring with Warzone again. <laughs> you can see how long lifelong promises last. Yeah, not that long. Bingo. So, you know, midway through the match, I'm reaching for a tag. El, Cam- El Savahe Jr. is halfway up the block walking away with a friend of his. And I'm like, okay. I go, I chase him halfway up the block, bring him back to the ring, tag him in. He dances around for about five minutes with uh, Warpath. 
then he tags me in. I didn't see it happen, but at the same time, Warpath tagged in Warzone. Mm. So I go in there blind, not even realizing Warzone's in the ring. Mm -hmm. I go to charge him. He caught me again. And basically from there, he handed me to Warpath. Warpath is standing on the top turnbuckle. Uh-oh. There's only one place to go from there. Straight down. Yeah. Five feet. They hit me with a power bomb off the top turnbuckle. As if that wasn't bad enough, folks. I hit the canvas. Warzone stands up and bounces off the ropes, and he falls on me. Right in the middle of the ring. Wow. Gee, gee that didn't hurt <laughs> much. <laughs> no, but I'm laying there trying to breathe. What happens? Mike Stone comes into the ring. He starts whipping me with a belt. Now, look, think about it this way. I can't even breathe, much less move. He's whipping me with a strap. I'm laying there looking at him. Mike, if I could breathe, you'd be dead by now. Except what I wanted to do after that show was over, I wanted to talk to Joe and Mike about issuing a challenge for another, whatever upcoming show. And unfortunately, it never materialized because Mike died too soon. I think it would have been a great match. I probably would have lost it, most of them, but it would have been an interesting feud because Mike was that good, you know. And I've always, I've always said that to anybody who would listen, anybody who knew Mike. I didn't care for him personally because he had such an ego, but I always had major respect for his ability in the ring. You know, he gave you a good show, great match, you know. Always got hurt doing it, bloody limb injuries, arms, legs, whatever. Mm -hmm. An occasional head injury, but he always gave you an excellent uh, performance. How big of a of a of a person? Well, Mike was, he? was about my height. He was about 140, 150 pounds. Oh wow! So he was practically time, a cruiserweight. Mm -hmm, he was a cruiserweight, and about that time, I was about 215 pounds. I see. And you know, it would have been an interesting match. Mm -hmm. I know I wouldn't have gone over, but I, I wouldn't mind putting a guy like Mike over because he was, he was that, in my opinion, that good of a talent. Mm -hmm. I would have been probably disappointed a little bit, but at least, you know, I have a chance to be in there doing what I'm enjoying, and I'm facing a worthwhile opponent. Would you say that he was probably the one opponent that you respected the most in the ring? Well, one of them, yeah. Because I also held a lot of respect for the late, great Inferno. Great trainer, great wrestler, and he knew how to do things where you knew you weren't going to get hurt no matter where it was. You know, because we're arguing over who's supposed to be refereeing a match at one of Mad Dog's block parties. Mm -hmm. So we're both trying to referee the match at the same time. I make one call, he makes the opposite call, and we're, we're bending it back and forth. Next thing I know, he charges up on me, grabs me, turns me upside down, and hits a, hits a body slam on the concrete. And he did it in such a way... I didn't even feel it, but I I, show, I saw the like, he's trying to kill me, you know, because <laughs> after the show was over, we got together, had a beer, and you know, I always had a lot of respect for that. I always had a lot of respect for Mad Dog for the same reason. He'd beat the hell out of you in the ring, but after the sh after the match was over, he'd sit down and he'd sit down and crack a beer with you. Really Sometimes nice. over your head, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think Mike would have been the same way because he he loved to have a good uh, case or two after a show. I see. I mean, you know, because he he was hot, part of a group called the Hit Squad, mm -hmm. which originally was the Commando, Homicide, Monster Mac, and Mike. He got away from the homi He got away from the Hit Squad, more or less. Actually, Commander got away from the hit squad. He more or less quit, so it was like monster Mac and guys like that. And, you know, it was sort of like the independent version of the Four Horsemen. I see. And they, they were good at what they did, so, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I would have enjoyed working with Mike. Now, was there an opponent that you absolutely dreaded going up against? Yeah, Warzone. Definitely war zone. Well, considering the fact both times I fought him, he, he damn near killed me. 
<laughs> of course. I, I respected Warzone as a person because it turns out outside the ring he was a really nice guy. Inside the ring he was a monster. And he was very stiff too, which didn't help things. Mm. You know, you can get hurt when you got somebody who's too stiff on you. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I got to know him. We were on our way to Gino Caruso's for a show, I think. Either Caruso's or a place in East New York. And I got to talk to him on the bus ride down. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I found out I'm basically a really nice guy. I spoke to Mad Dog. He said uh, Warzone was a great guy. Just don't, lo- don't lend him anything because you'll never see it again. You know, like mm-hmm. tapes, DVDs, and stuff like that. He had a tendency not to give things back. Uh-oh. So I'm like, oh, okay, it's a good thing I never loaned him anything. <laughs> no, but I did like Warzone as a person. I didn't like him as an opponent because he was too stiff and definitely too tough. Mm-hmm. Look at it this way. You know Duke Schneider, right? The yep. pit bull? Yes, I do. Anybody who can make pit bull Duke Schneider nervous is a man to be respected. Nice. Because I had uh, pit bull on my show the last two episodes I did. Mm-hmm. And we talked about a match he had for a brass knuckles title at, the, at uh, CSI in Willowbrook. And he told me he was a nervous wreck going out there because he'd never met uh, Warzone before. He saw this man, and he's like, oh, my God, look at the size of him. He was afraid he was going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. You remember my ex-girlfriend, Eileen? I think so, yeah. She was with me for this show. I was there with um, some friends, and... She goes up to ringside because she saw Homicide coming out. Then they introduced Warzone. We were both thinking, is that the same Warzone we know? Turns out it was. So she runs down to ringside. She over to like in her best uh, little girl fashion. Hello, sweetie. You know, <laughs> threw him completely off his game because he didn't expect to see her. So he's like in something of a daze because he got along with her quite well. So when he turned around, Schneider hit him with one punch. Knocked him the hell out. Wow. I mean, basically, one right cross, and that was it. It was over. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, damn. And when I spoke to uh, Duke about this, he told me before that match got underway, he was as, as nervous as he could be. He was afraid he was going to get hurt because wow. Matt Warzone was so much bigger than he is. Well, that's 6'4 and 500 pounds, yeah. Well, hell, now uh, Duke, what, 6'2", 6'3", something mm-hmm. like that? And he's like, at the most, I think it was about 300 pounds. Mm-hmm. So I could understand him being nervous. But the way he took him out, that one punch was definitely uh, noteworthy. Because he, th- he didn't expect it to work. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that was pretty cute. That was actually the last time I saw Warzone before his passing. He died of, I, I hear he died of cancer a few years oh. back. It's too bad because he was a nice guy. Yeah. That's like um, another guy that I worked with, the World Wrestling Union, mm-hmm. a guy named Carnage. Great guy. Died in 2006. He was, what, I think 28 years old? Oh, Died wow. of stomach cancer. Oh, man. That's horrible. And he was such a nice guy, too. Good wrestler, good showman. He liked to have fun in the ring, you know. Mm-hmm. I, fortunately, I still have videotape of Carnage in action, you know, from a couple of the WWU episodes mm-hmm. that were done at, at Pedro's. Yeah. Yeah, you know. No. Yeah. It, it's, it's really frightening that wrestlers have been passing away, not just in, uh, in the big time, but also in the independent circuit. Oh, yeah, it, hap- it happens everywhere. The independent circuit, though, when you look at it, most of the time... It's because of illness or some kind of an injury. Mm-hmm. In the big times, you get people dying from drug overdoses. Uh, a couple of wrestlers died from, in car accidents. Yeah. JYD mm-hmm. killed in a uh, collision on the New Jersey Turnpike. Yeah. He fell asleep at the wheel. He was so tired from uh, doing a series of shows. Wow. So that was really tragic. You know, just uh, now. You see the younger stars dying for no reason at all. Yeah. Guys like Lance Cade, remember him? Mm-hmm. 
died of a heart attack. He was 29 years old. <sighs> Amazing. Sickening is more like it, but yeah. you know. Uh, I try to steer away from the death aspect of it, though, you know. Yeah. I like to try and remember the people the way I knew them, mm-hmm. you know. You know, I try to remember Mike as a sarcastic smartass that he was, yeah. and the fact that he was also a great wrestler. Mm-hmm. And uh, I like to remember Inferno for the great wrestler he was and the great trainer he was, mm-hmm. and the good husband because he was he was Mad Dog and Mike's stepdad. Mm-hmm. He'd been together with their mom for many many years. Yeah. So now Joe's basically an, orf- or- an orphan. His mom died a few years ago too. Wow. About a year or two after uh, Inferno. I see. Which, uh, you know, is terrible. Oh. I liked her. She was cool. Good. You know. Well, we have about four minutes left. Uh, we'd be remiss if we did not mention some of the stuff that's going on in the business today. Of course, we all know about what's going on in WWE. Yeah, except me. I don't watch it much anymore. So what's going on? Yep. Uh, uh, apparently the same old, same old that uh, we've been watching before. The only good thing that I like about what happened with the company was, was the fact that they finally gave Kofi Kingston a shot at the WWE title, and he got it. And from what I've been hearing, he's been doing very good. Mm-hmm. And it's not the WWE title. It's the WWE World title. That belt actually says World Heavyweight Champion on it. Mm-hmm. Um what I don't like, I heard they gave the uh, Universal title back to Brock Lesnar. I have no idea why, especially considering that he's basically a part-time wrestler now. Mm-hmm. But I don't even know why they have a Universal title. We're the only life in this universe. Mm-hmm. But the, um, there is a lot of hope for wrestling fans outside of the WWE and even TNA for that matter because, for one... This new promotion, All Elite Wrestling, has been doing shows for a few months now. And they've been having a lot of WWE wrestlers competing for them. The former Dean Ambrose, now known as John Moxley, which is his old Combat Zone character. Cody Rhodes is there now. And actually, Cody Rhodes is a former NWA world champion. That's right. That's another thing. The best part about the wrestling business is the fact that the NWA has not necessarily made a comeback because, they, to be honest with you, they never really went anywhere. True. But the NWA title has officially been made relevant again. Which is good because that was a very prestigious title Mm -hmm. going all the way back to 1948 yep and there are some really really good young wrestlers that have been competing under the nwa banner and also adding to this is the fact that they've got i guess a partnership going with the ring of honor yeah i think i heard that me and spike stevens occasionally get together and watch ring of honor Mm -hmm. let's Mm. see how far the NWA, the modern day NWA goes this time with the crop of talent that they do right now because only God knows that the old NWA fans want to see some of the uh, old stuff make it, make, it, make it return. Yeah, I'd like to see that myself because, I mean, I never got a chance to watch the NWA itself until it became WCW. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty much what destroyed the old NWA. Yeah. When Jim Crockett sold out the biggest NWA promotion. And the territories died. That, well, well, Vince is responsible for that. Yeah. I would, I would love to see the NWA come back as one of the major forces. That would be wonderful. Not to mention surprising. Mm-hmm. Champ, thank you You're so welcome. much. I'm glad you called me to, and asked me to come down. I haven't been here in so long. And we're very happy that you, that you were able to make a comeback here. If I knew anything more about other sports, I'd join you as a co-host on your regular show. Quite all right. Let's say thanks to Mike Stanton, who's on the other side of the glass. For everyone here, I'm Jamie, along with T-Dog. Good night, everyone. See you next time again.